been a frustrating process for them and they're having a difficult time, you know, getting to that next, getting to that next level. Um, do they not realize that the reason that the skill is frustrating is because they lack some of the ancillary skills? So like, what's their level of understanding? What's their background knowledge around this particular skill? Those pieces are really important. And then the teaching execution. So like, what's, what's, what's my process? How am I going to present it? What order am I going to present it? How, how, what factors weigh into uh, how I'm going to be able to adjust and adapt as the player moves along? What's the feedback loop? So feedback loop's really important. Um, and what I'm trying to do is, is create a situation in which I know what it looks like. The player knows what it feels like. I don't know how it feels and he doesn't know or she doesn't know what it looks like. So we have an immediate disconnect. I'm watching something, but don't know how it feels. He's or she's feeling through whatever it is, but they don't know what it looks like. So we have to bridge this. So I like to create this, this, this loop where the player uh, gets an opportunity to, share, to see what's going on, to see where they're at. So that, cause sometimes it feels worse than it looks. So in other words, if it's, if it's something where I'm trying to make a, a fundamental change in movement, it's not going to feel very good at first because I'm changing a movement pattern. So initially they're gonna be like, Ooh, that feels weird. That feels different. But meanwhile, the movement might be look really good. It might be in the way I want it to go. So I need to be able to share that with the player because otherwise, like if it feels weird, they're, they're going to have hesitations in being able to move it along. So I need to create a feedback loop where I'm constantly asking them how it feels and they're constantly having an ability to see what it looks like. I think that that's an important aspect of the development process. Uh, and then game transfer tracking. Once we get going, I want to know what transfer tracking we have. Like uh, when I'm, when I watch the next game, I want to see how many opportunities he had to use it. And did they actually use it? Did they use it in the right context? Did they, were they able to maybe manipulate the environment to be able to use it? Like what level of competency in the transfer do we actually have here? Skill analysis. So the, the skill that we're going to talk about with uh, Seamus is the pivot shot. This is a predominant shot that he uses. It's a very high utility, low result. So it's perfect type of target skill for me with him because it's something he uses a lot. He can create it a lot, but he has a low level of result. So I know he can create this shot. If I can influence it positively in any way, I'm going to expand his results. I'm going to be able to build trust with this player. This is a great skill for me to invest time in. And it's good for him because it's a high utility shot that he could use. He generally uses it as a sifter. Uh, I personally think that this could be a scoring weapon for him. And with some better technique and a little bit different mindset towards the shot, I, th I think he could really utilize it uh, in a lot of different ways. I also think he could blend it with some deception and use it, uh, do some deception sequences to be able to use it. And I also think he could use it in combination with other applications. So right now we're using the pivot shot, but he could use it in a pivot pass and we could use the same techniques that we're going to be using to try to build up this pivot we could use it as part of how we're going to use with the pass. Um, his current pivot play applications are, he uses it, uh, there's three zone escapes. He uses it in the defensive zone to escape. He uses it in the neutral zone and he uses it in the offensive zone as an escape kind of maneuver. He also uses it, um, it uh, in the hot zone. So a hot zone is the space between the top of the circle in the defensive zone and the offensive blue line. So that space there, usually for defensemen, it's a very important zone to be able to, especially for offensive players, to be able to make plays that lead to entries and all that jazz, uh, joining the rush and things. Well, he he uses that 
this skill in passing in this area. And he also uses it in puck protection, the pivot as well. So the pivot shot technical adjustments is we're going to try to pull his feet under his center of mass. He's got his feet split off from his body, which is creating a lot of the problem. Uh, we're also going to initiate the movement with the upper body. He doesn't use the upper body in any way. It kind of tails behind. I want it to move first. So I want the upper body to lead the lower body. Um, I want to prep the shot, sorry, prep the puck to shoot inside the pivot. So there's times where he's late getting the puck in the spot in which he should be looking to shoot. And he's got to ha add one more handle or he's got to do something before he can shoot. And it messes up his timing of the release. I want to encourage a violent change of feet. I would like a lot of the power to come from the lower body. I like to shift it, shift his weight off the outside plant foot and, and, and get power in the change of feet. He, he, he uses the outside foot plant foot um, and he just kind of hangs on that. I want to get the change of feet and find a way to get uh, much more in terms of power from that change of feet. I also want to transfer the upper body and the lower body conflict into torque for greater velocity. For, so if I can get the upper body going first and I can get the lower body torqued, now we can really create a better opportunity for more velocity and I can blend it inside of other movements like I talked about, combine the pivot applications into a single possession sequence. So he could use it as a pivot escape on a, on a, on a, you know, a retrieval. He could then come into the hot zone and use a pivot pass he could get it back at the point and use a pivot shot. So he could use it in all three zones, maybe in the same position sequence. Um, and then he should be able to manufacture application opportunities. So he shouldn't just wait to use this. He should be able to manufacture the shot opportunity he wants. Okay. So finally we get to some video. So let me just, this is going to happen each time. I couldn't, didn't, um, I forgot about the audio. So each time I'm going to have to get the audio and, and adjust it. So I'll get that sorted out. So let me show you. Here's Seamus Ray here. So he's going to get this puck. And uh, what I don't like about a lot of times when he uses this is he uses this shot uh, when he's at a deficit. So he doesn't have a space advantage. He doesn't, he hasn't done enough to create a shot at lane. He's in a pickle and he uses the pivot shot as a problem solving maneuver, which I don't think is a problem necessarily. I just don't like it that he uses it that often as part of a problem solving thing and using it as a deficit. I think he should use it when he's in an advantageous situation. So this is a deficit situation. He's going to get over here. You can see he gets really wide. His feet are outside of his center of mass. And now his weight is going to anchor onto the outside foot here. Sorry, the, out, the other foot. Sorry, that's the inside foot. This is the outside foot. This is what he likes to do. And there's going to be no transfer. You can see his weight is leaning towards the blue line. So he's trying to shoot this way. And his weight is going the other way. So of course, I'm not gonna love that. And like, he's just sifting a puck towards the net. Here he is again, he's up at the top here. So this time he's gonna move over. He's gonna come downhill. He's gonna come out the other side. Now he's gonna get the puck here at the top. And now he's in a backward back pedal. I don't love that his puck is in the middle of his body. This is one of the things, whoops, that he does. Sorry, hit the wrong button. Let me get you through through this again. That's going to happen a few times. I apologize in advance. So here he is again. So now as he walks over the top, he's going to, again, this time he executes his pivot. He's going to do it again, but this time he's again using the weight is outside of his center of mass. It's on the outside and he's at, he's tried to create an advantage for himself, but he's not able to really create it as an advantageous shot. So I don't love that. Let's show one more here. So this time, this is Seamus here at the top. So he's going to walk across here. He uses a great fake there. He tries to sell a pass to the backside to open up his shot lane. And then now he shoots. This one's a little better in terms of weight transfer um, to get the puck through. 
but you can see he uses his shot a lot. Uh, these are all, by the way, in two games. So this is all two games played. Here he is again over here. Um, so now he's going to walk across again. Uh, there's his shot. All right. So these are now plays in the hot zone. So let me get kill the audio here. This is Seamus here. He's going to make a play to the far side. He's going to use a pivot pass here. So as he skates up, he uses it in deception. And then he uses it inside the pass to make a cross ice pass. Uh, this is another one here. This time, this is him here with the puck. He's going to try to make a pivot here as he goes to make a, a, a play down the wall. He's going to use it here in deception, tries to sell the step by, then uses it inside the pass. This one is a little better. The only problem is both feet weight is pretty evenly distributed. I don't love that. I want to be on one foot or the other all the time. Uh, this is another one in deception. So this one's really good, actually. You'll see him. He gets his weight on one foot right here, and he's going to transfer his weight inside the pivot to the other foot. So that one was a good one. So you can see he uses this. It's a high utility play. He uses it a lot. This one's a little uh, pass up the middle. And again, you can see he uses his weight is on this foot. I want it to be on the other in the transfer. And you can see his upper body is not really involved in this particular play. So what are we going to do about this? So this is a sequence. We had one ice time with him in this group. Um, and so this is the drill progression. I think there's 10 or 11 drills. I'm going to show you each one of them and walk through exactly what we're doing inside of each of the progressions. So this one, we're just going to isolate some footwork. So Seamus is going to walk over the top here. And what I'm doing is, is I'm creating this pivot across. He's going to go multiple times across the blue line. And what I'm trying to do is get him on one foot or the other. So from one foot, transfer the other. So I don't love that he's not getting off this foot. This one I like. See how he transfers completely from one foot to the other? This is the kind of thing that I'm interested in as it relates to, uh, to, his, sh to his shot. So here's another one again. This one's a little better. Transferring from one foot to the other. Now, again, his upper body's a mess as he's uh, falling forward. He's not initiating. You can see we call this moving in one piece. So he's going to move all in one piece here. This is no good. I need the upper body to move first to initiate the movement. Um, so that one, he nearly falls. It would actually be good if he did to, uh, to be able to, um, to reinforce my point. This one is a little better. You'll see the upper body starts to get more involved, but uh, it's not quite where I want it to be. But that's drill one. Uh, this is now uh, drill two. So now I'm going to just take it and I'm going to move it close to the net. So I don't have them at the point shooting. I got them close to the net. Shot distance as it relates to building a shot can be really important as part of the development process. And even though this is largely a, a skill he uses near the point, I don't want to start from there because then he's probably going to be overshooting it. He's going to have a higher probability to regress to old habits to get the puck there because he needs a lot of violence to get the puck there. So he's just going to go to what he, what has worked for him before. When I bring it closer to the net, it's a lot, got a lot less distance. It's going to give, make him more inclined to want to try what I want him to do. So this is what I want him to do. I want him to initiate the movement with his upper body. So you see his head, his head is going first. He's initiating the movement with his upper body. Now he's going to transfer his weight fully from one foot to the other to deliver the shot. So we're getting closer, a little clunky, but we're getting closer. Here's another example here. Again, transferring his weight from one foot to the other with a much more of a violence inside the weight transfer, which is a really important aspect for me as it relates to him. Here's another one. The other, uh, the other big advantage of this too, as we try to get him to again, use this weight transfer, is to try to get the skating down and get the timing of the foot landing as the puck is being released. Trying to get that timing down is another big one. So you can see me 
Uh, I am the heavier set gentleman here in the middle that's having a difficult time uh, with it, but I can manufacture one of these uh, just to show him what it's supposed to look like at least half-assed. And here he is here. Now, this is an important point also with shot distance. Seamus Casey is an elite player. He scored a ton of goals at his level. And um, as I'm trying to rebuild something, him scoring is actually a big deal uh, as it relates to his confidence in moving along the shot process. So I'm fooling him in some ways that the shot is way further ahead than what it is by allowing him to have success uh, at this distance. And I really want him to get comfortable at this distance. The other thing is we know for sure that um, in goal scoring for defensemen, in the national hockey league, uh, the top 20 goal scorers uh, tend to shoot uh, a high percentage of goals come from what we call middle distance. Seamus projects to be a very good uh, offensive defenseman. So I'd like him to get comfortable in this area anyway, so it serves a bit of a dual purpose. But regardless of what I knew about middle distance, just putting him in this range, giving him an opportunity to put pucks in the net, believe me, it matters to him. So now we're going to pressure the timing. So what I mean by that is I'm going to take the two skills that we worked on and I'm going to pressure the timing by he's going to have to pivot across the line and then in the middle, in the middle, he's going to have to release the puck. So let's watch him here as he, as he comes across the top, he does it a few times and then now he's got a manufacturing. You can see it's way better now, as you can see, he's starting to understand the violence that I want to have into here. And now he sees he's, I don't need like the curling team to come out and, uh, and brush it to the net. He's going to get some pace here. He's starting to believe that there's, there's something to this. So I'm starting to make some headway with him. He's also, you can't see it here, but he's also starting to ask some questions um, in terms of timing um, to be able to, to, to get a better understanding. So that's another indicator that I know we're starting to make some, make some headway. One of the things I like to do um, is now we've got kind of a head start. What I want to do now is I, I, I want to leave the shot a little bit and I want to work on some of the other applications. So I want to build up the other, I don't just focus on the shot all the time. I'm going to take it, leave the shot for a bit, work on some other things. So this is one here where he's working uh, oh, sorry. This is still the pivot shot from the top. Oh, sorry. This is a sequence now. So now we're going to do both these shots at the same time. Sorry, we're not there yet. So this one here, we're going across. So that's your second drill that we just worked on. Now we're going to go to the net and now he'll pick up another puck and he's going to work over the top to shoot the first shot. There's another one going in. He's happy with that. So this is the kind of thing that's really important um, is to start taking my drills and stacking them on top of each other. So I have one walk in the line. I add it with the other one so he doesn't forget the key elements uh, inside of that. This is another one here. We walk across. This time I give him a middle distance. Now he walks. This time he catches it off the pass. And now he's got to do it from the off. So it's basically the opposite, right? It did one from the first shot was middle distance. Now this one's from the point. The previous uh, time we did it, was the opposite. All right, so now this is the parallel concept. So this is now, I'm just gonna use it in puck protection. So here he's working on just using one foot at a time. So how much do you think I love this? I don't, like he's on both feet here, evenly distributed. This is not my thing. I like one foot, then the other. I'm not a two foot kind of guy. I like the one foot or the other. So we got work to do. So here he's better. This is one foot, other foot. So I'm happier with that. And we, this side, he doesn't like this side. As you can see, he likes to get two feet down. So I'm not loving that. So now again, I just kind of blend it with other things. This time he's here. Once he gets down, he gets into a little, uh, he gets into a pass here off a delay. So again, I'm just adding different elements as it relates to this shot um, between both these players. And now you can see this one, he uses his pivot to open up. 
So I'm happy with that. That's a good start with that. Now we're going to go into, uh, this is uh, now a sequence uh, of parallels. So now I'm going to do the shot plus the, plus the weight shift. So this time I got them going the other way for the shot. Once they shoot, now I got him getting a pass. And now they're doing a protection. So a little bit, a uh, little bit awkward here, but kind of got the right point. So using now that protection before he shoots and then the other guy gets it. So the other guy can do it too. So we have uh, both of them doing, uh, both of them doing the skill at the same time. And then this group here is doing it the orange. They do the same thing. And then in the end, it turns into a two on two uh, at the end and they, uh, they get a little, a little game out of it. So again, it starts one side, then it goes the other side. And then ultimately they, uh, they get an opportunity to go two on two. And then now look what we got two on two and we already got a, a transfer. So I'm happy with this. He gets a transfer here on a weight transfer into the, into the shot, which is good. And then we got Seamus using it on the backside as well. So those are, it's a good drill just to kind of start pulling different elements. This is a, a real hallmark of the way I like to do my skill uh, development as it relates to transfer is I'm a big believer that um, a player is going to have a better chance of transferring skill if they get multiple interactions with that skill. So I'm using it in all kinds of different ways so that they get more comfortable in doing it. Um, in, and then when it comes to the shot, they're gonna have greater fluidity. But if I only use it in the shot, then we move on to something else. It's not involved in that. We move on to something else. It's not involved in that. And then now we come back to it. The whole thing's been disconnected and just elongating the process. If I'm truly committed to dropping this in, then I'm gonna work through the entire process and, and uh, I'm gonna have this pivot in everything that we're doing. So this one now is, uh, he's got to manufacture the pivot shot. So he's going to come in, he gets a shot initially. Uh, now it's a two on two, but the rules behind the two on two is that in order to shoot, you have to use the pivot shot. So he's got to find a way now to get the puck. Both, all four of these guys are trying to figure out how they can create this pivot shot. And there's a, a first indicator that I'm not doing a great job with my job here because this is a first opportunity to use this skill and he does this player doesn't use it so that's I'm taking a lot of note of that because I'm going to talk to him as soon as we get back in the line now we're going to see Seamus he does a great job with a nudge he gets some separation off the nudge really great nudge here and now he goes into his pivot shot now I don't love this he is on one foot to the other but he's very predominant on that right foot. I want them to come completely off that right foot. So I'm taking all this information in as I'm starting to see whether I did a good job or not, or where I need to go next as it relates to his development. So now you can see he's adding pivots in here to get more in. There's a pivot shot here now. So I've added that instead of making them shoot just a regular shot, they got to use the pivot shot. And then now here we are again. He's in his shot. Here's this guy up at the top doing a great job. Now he's got a pivot pass attempt there. That's excellent. Seamus gets it again. Another pivot pass. So we're doing a pretty good job here now. And then Seamus gets a little bit of space. Once he gets this space, you know he's going to use it. That one was a lot better. So you can see he gets across and he uses it way better. So I'm getting happier that we're using. Now we're going to do the pass option. So this time there's three of them. They got to cut each other off. And then ultimately now we got to get in and make a pivot pass right there into the shot. So now I'm just adding a whole nother kind of layer to the situation where they got to use it again, multiple instances with the same skill. There's Ella. Now there's Gavin. Ella is going to have to try a pivot shot. And now I see I failed again because she didn't do, had an opportunity to use a pivot shot, didn't use it or pivot pass, sorry, didn't use it. So that's an area that I gotta, I gotta really work um, to make sure that the next rep that they're aware that 
um, that's what I'm looking for. So now I'm going to create an ex exploration platform. This is an important part of, of uh, skill development is I'm going to give them multiple opportunities to utilize this skill. So here they're just in a rush. And this time he uses it off the pivot catch. So you'll see here he's looking as he opens up, he's looking to one time this. That is okay by me because that's part of a pivot and anything to do with a pivot, I'm all about. So I'm good with that. This is just a different in, in, uh, different way or different platform for him to use multiple different skills. So this is another example here of trying to get it. This time Ella's gonna walk up, misses another opportunity. There's Seamus in the pivot shot. I'm happy with that. Another opportunity here. And you can see I'm not doing great um, in terms of trying to get this pivot shot in there. It's very difficult. Let's see if Ella will do it on this one. Nope. So you see I'm 0 for 3 here with her. So I got work to do with her. Uh, this one here. So now we're doing it inside the pass. So now I open up with a square here. All I care about is the pivot. Now you can see it's gone over. These guys have the right handedness too uh, on this particular play. As you can see, it went in a square. When it got over here, this guy, he now is going to use a pivot shot from the top. So that's pretty good. Now it's going to go the other way. As it goes the other way, we get other pa passes. Now Seamus, he's got to use his pivot shot here. And now it flips. So now the two kids from the, the bottom now become kids at the top. Now Ella's got to go in, generate her shot. And then we get one more here with an opportunity to shoot. So just looking for a multitude of instances in which we can utilize the skill as often as we can. Very good shot there by uh, Gavin. Now we're coming back over. Let's see if my friend Ella does it. Oh, we're making progress with Ella. So that's good. We're making some headway. So that's a win. I'm happy with that. Here's Seamus. He's going to come across. And of course, now we're starting to get somewhere. He's starting to rip this puck now. He likes this distance, which is a distance I like for him there as well. So we're getting progress. Now I'm just going to let them go. Uh, this is a five on O, uh, but they have to manufacture the application. So they got to use whatever uh, you got the pass, you got a cutoff, you got shot. They just got to find ways to utilize the skill. So any which way in which they can use it is what I'm after. So here we go is Ella, good one at the top there. Another opportunity, she misses her second opportunity but scores, the boys are happy with that, although I am not. This one here, she comes over the top. Now Seamus is gonna get going. Okay, pivot shot, perfect. Next guy, you're gonna pick up the puck. Great, pivot pickup, how much do I love that? That's fantastic. So all these situations, they're just challenged to just use the skills as they play with each other. Um, they've got free to go wherever they want. There's a pivot pass again. These are all just try to use it as often as you can. Uh, there's another one. And then Seamus is going in. There he is again, shooting it. The other guy looking for a pivot shot. So these are just good application opportunities. Open for them. They can, you can see there's no pattern. Just five of you go and make it happen. Just here's the rules. You need to create a pivot pass, pivot shot, pivot pickup. I don't care, but pivot uh, as much as you can. So that was that. Um, so that was the end of the practice. And so the strategies to incorporate the development into your practice are as follows. So you have traditional team uh a traditional team practice elements. You have a uh, goalie ice of some sort. You got some starter drills that uh, get the goalies warmed up, maybe get the kids up and down the sheet. You might do a split. Uh, you got some team concept stuff. You're going to work on a breakout, got to work on a four check, got to work on a back check, got to work on all that stuff. Um, so these are all the things. Uh, now you have opposing concepts. So these things are op op opposing. So you have breakout versus the four check so we could we could do that and work it up opposing so you work in both ends breakout one end four check the other now we could work uh, in opposing concepts yep and then create competition maybe do some special teams the way i like to work though is i like to do 
uh, undercurrent development in team practice elements. So what I want to do is have a target skill that's being utilized in each of the drills, whether you lead, the, the player leads with the skill before they get into the rep, whether it's something that occurs after the rep or whether it's something that's expressed inside the rep, I don't care. But every time you go, it's going to be involved in something. Maybe not as explicit as what I was talking about, but uh, in terms of my practice, but these are ways to do it in a regular practice. So you have your goalie ice, you have your development pods. So you've you know divided them up into groups of three, four, five, whatever. And you're going to do some kind of an introduction to the target skill. So in this one, it's pivot shot, pivot pass. You do your starter, starter drills. But in the starter drills, as you're warming up the goalie, of course, we're asking the players to shoot pivot shots. We're asking them to use pivot passes, to just shoot um, in, a, in a pivot one-timer. So we're going to incorporate this skill all the way throughout. Now we're going to go into a split. And we're going to have the target themes inside of that. So once we get to the um, to the team concept drills, like the breakout, well, of course, we can use pivots on pickups. We can use pivots um, on uh, deception. You can use pivots on on cutting off the hands of the forechecker. Uh, you can use uh, you have a pivot for the winger that's going to come down. He's got a pivot. There's lots of opportunities. Uh, on the forecheck, we could use a pivot seal contact, which would be a really good one in here. So if they get there on time, they lift the stick, they use their hips to get through to be able to steal the puck is a good one. On the opposing concepts, you see which one you taught better. And then, uh, then they have to manufacture. It's a breakout versus a forecheck and they got to manufacture. So you're working on the, all these elements, but you have this undercurrent that's kind of going through. I'm just using pivot as an example, it could be anything. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm just saying when you're doing skill development, you're trying to incorporate it with team practice. Sometimes you can have this element that this, uh, this, this uh, undercurrent that just runs through the whole thing of your, of your uh, whole part of your practice. And then you could do some competition and inside the competition, you can do it like the way I like to do it, which is I like to create uh, rules or restrictions or constraints that surround my games that I'm going to do so that uh, in order to, to shoot, you have to use this type of shot or you have to use a pivot pass or you have to cut somebody off before uh, in a pivot before you can make a play. There's some kind of constraint that's inside the competition that they have to figure out in order to drop it in. And then, of course, you go to your special teams and who doesn't like that? Um, so this is Seamus now. This is his first game of the season. And uh, we're going to see him. He is number 43 right here. And let's see what happens. So really nice little escape. You can see how elite this kid is. That is not for, your, for the faint of heart. He's going to walk across the top of the zone. And there's your pivot shot for a goal. And you'll notice that he took me up on my offer that I really like middle distance shots. The research suggests that defensemen who score a ton and score at the highest level in the league, they tend to score their highest amount of goals from this middle distance. Seamus, if you would like to be an elite player, you want to get to the National Hockey League and you want to show that you can score, this is probably going to be one of your pathways. So adding this shot to it would be great. Now, let's just take a look and evaluate Seamus and whether or not he used a pivot shot with any effectiveness. So what we're looking for first is an initiation of the upper body to see if that moved first. I'm going to argue that he's probably pretty close to on time. I'm also going to say like, does he get from one foot to the other? I'm going to say, yes, he gets from one foot. He clearly gets his weight directly under his body, which was a major concern of mine. I didn't like that with his, uh, with his uh, weight transfer. So we got his weight transfer underneath the body. I'm pretty happy. Could use a little work on the celly, but I think everything else was, uh, was pretty reasonable. So uh, that's, that's what I got for you as it relates to uh, game training to game transfer and how there's like, that's one path that you can follow that, what was clear about it was that I was very um, intentional in making sure 
that in everything we were doing, he was exploring it. So he's building confidence in all types of different aspects. And it's not the number of reps that he took from the, the total number of reps that he took from the shot that I believe made the biggest difference. It's the total number of reps he did in totality of the number, the multitude of instances or situations that I created and, and interactions he had with the skill that created the comfort level that has led him down a path where he feels comfortable be able to use it. And it's already a skill he uses a lot. Now he can do it a lot better. So that's, uh, that's what I got for you. Um, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask specific to training to game transfer? Cause I, I be, I would love to, uh, to answer any questions that you might have. Hi, Daryl. This is Greg Sharp. Um, my question is, is this something the player came to you with asking to work on, or is it something that you identified in his game and recommended you spend the time on? Uh, this is something that when Ella and I went to watch his game, um, we videotaped his game. And when we went back through it, I took, I took all of his shots and he's upwards of 70% of all of his shots taken were off this pivot shot. So I then shared these video clips, the same that I'm showing you guys. I shared them with him and I asked him um, if he was satisfied with the results of this particular shot. It's a high frequency shot. He actually scored two goals in the game, uh, two goals in one game and one goal in the third game. And none of the three, go none of the three goals were of this shot, yet 70% of the shots he takes are from this particular shot, which to me, is a bit ass backwards. So as I ask him, I say, Hey, like, is this something we should take a look at? So after he saw it, then he was like, man, I need to get better at that. I use that skill a lot. Like that's something I could get better at. So I took it to him and then I was gauging his response to see like, is this something that he really wants to work on? Once he said he was all in, then off we went. Most of the time I would suggest to you that the best transfers are going to come from one of two, uh, one of two, uh, one of two primary ways. One player is completely frustrated with something that they use a lot that has a very low instance rate. And now they're coming to you uh, at saying like, man, I got to do something with that. That's one way. And another way is for you to highlight that this is a high frequency event that you use that you have a low level of, of, uh, of success with. Sometimes the player is unaware that they use it this frequent because players, I mean, when they play, they just play. Like they're not really thinking about what they were actually doing. Yeah, they'll watch their shifts and they can see things. I took all of his shots, watched them back to back to back to back to back. That's what gave me the insight that I'm like, oh man, he uses his shot a lot. Then I bring that to him to gauge his response. Now, in his case, he knew that he used that shot a lot, but there have been situations where I've gone to a player and the player has been like, I don't even know I do that that much. That's crazy. That obviously I need to work on it. And then that heightened awareness makes a huge difference, of course, in the buy-in. Great question. Thank you very much for that answer. Keep them coming, JR. Let's go. Keep them coming. We got to get this going. I do have one right now. Um, it just came in. What's the advantage of shifting from one foot to the other? Is it, does it generate torque? Yeah. Uh, yes. It, it's there's there's two reasons. Number one, when you are on both feet, you are going to have your when your feet when your weight is centered, you're going to have to move to move. So if my weight is centered, I got to shift onto a, a foot in order to get off of it. So that is problematic for me. I don't like that. I want a player to be able to move at any time in whatever direction that they want to go and not have to move off center to do it. So that's one. It's the variability of options is one part of it. The other part of it is exactly what you're talking about, which is I believe that by using weight transfer inside of shooting motions, you will dramatically improve the potential for velocity. Now, velocity has a lot of elements to it. There's a lot of timing. 
Uh, and sometimes uh, if a player is, for example, a player comes down and they, they like to set their feet and then shoot. When I say you need to shoot, get your weight from one foot and change it to the other, initially there's going to be a decrease in velocity because the timing's all off. So the release points at the wrong time, they're not getting the down force, they're not getting the torque on the stick. So for sure, it's gonna come down. And the goal is, is to kind of move them along because eventually I'm gonna win out in the end. The weight transfer will give me the velocity, but the velocity is as much as I want the velocity, I'm more after the variability of movement that comes from one foot to the other. That's what I really want. Awesome. Um, any other questions, guys? I don't have anything. Oh, here we go. We got another one that just came in. At what age or level do you recommend following this type of process? Uh, transfer of learning and skill development. Um, I, I don't think that there's a, that there's a too young of an age to um, ask players to experiment with skills that you've taught them. So it doesn't matter you know, what it is that you're trying to teach them, um, you should be comfortable at the end of your practice to say, man, Tommy, I can't wait to see that on Saturday. I can't wait. Like we worked on it. I think it's at a good level. I think you can use it on Saturday. I'm really looking forward to seeing if you can do it and then watch to see if the player can find the right situation to see if they can manufacture a situation and, and have the confidence to work through it because part of this question, the question or the answer has less to do with age and more to do with the achievement gap. So the top part of your team performs at a level that's above the median of the league. Those kids have the luxury of being on the favorable side of the achievement gap. So they can be creative. They can try things. They got confidence because they can skate better than everyone. They can handle the puck better. They think better. The game feels slower. So they're on the right side of the achievement gap. The kid that's got a harder time doing this stuff is the guy on the wrong end of the achievement gap. This is the guy who is below the median of the league. The league performs at this level. His ability is at this level. So that makes the game feel a lot faster for him. It restricts his willingness to try different things. So I think it's less about the age and more about the way in which the roster is configured as it relates to the median of the league. And we need to do a better job, in my opinion, of trying to find ways for the kids who are below the median of the league to be trying to do things that are maybe a little bit outside their comfort zone or something that they've, that they've learned. The kids that are above the light, above that, they have no problem with it because they get the puck a lot. They get all these opportunities. And so they can try different things and you should be encouraging them as well. But I think the question is more about what we're doing with the kids below the median of the league. I think that's a really important question that I don't know that we ask enough. So how do we get them from to try it then? How do we get them to try it? So you have to empower them based on uh, your reaction to failure and your collective culture that you have that surrounds your team as it relates to failure. So there's nothing worse than little Billy going out there and you guys have just taught him to do a specific skill on Tuesday. Now it's Saturday. He raises the gumption to try it and now he turns the puck over and they end up shooting it in your net now he comes back to the bench what's the reaction of the other players on your team what's the reaction of you the coaching staff to that particular instance that is going to dictate that kid's willingness to want to try to do it again if he comes back to the bench and the captain of your team who's the best player in the league says, hey, Tommy, good try. You'll get it next time. I saw you work on it last week. You were great last week. Try it again. What do you think that's going to do to him? He's going to be feel like he's a 10 foot tall. He's going to try it again. And if you say, hey, I think that you tried it 
but here's a way where you could do it differently, how you could make it better. You maybe you waited too long and the guy was on top of you. There's a circumstances that surrounded why that play didn't work. You can highlight that and empower him and say, don't worry about it. You can make that adjustment. And it'll go. That's one, that's one and one response. The other response is, okay, he ain't ready for that. Stop the whole show. Don't do it again because it's ending up in our own net. And I don't want to get a call from the goalie's mom saying that we got Tommy trying to do funny stuff and it's ending up on his goals against today because I can't afford to have that. This is what we're talking about. It's a culture thing. And I think you can build it inside your team. The reaction to failure is what's going to dictate it. And early on in the season is your best opportunity to build that culture. And then you might not have to worry about your reaction to failure later because the kids are so empowered and you've done a good job that they're, they're going to be able to absorb some of those things much more organically than maybe you would have if you wait till later. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, more development and less focus on the outcome, the end out outcome. Uh, what's the biggest difference between some of your top players and those who don't get to that level in terms of how they translate from practice to game? Uh, the, the best players tend to take what uh, is offered to them and they are always looking for different ways to expand on it. Um, different ways to adjust it. They're looking, so for example, uh, the best player, when you teach a delay, rush delay, well, he's got the rush delay. He's going to try a stutter step. He's not going to, he's going to do one. You taught him to turn his back and turn to the wall, like a Crosby delay, I think they call it. Uh, this guy is going to do that. He's going to do a little S pattern. The next time he comes in, he's going to uh, fake like he's going to do that. He's going to come across the middle. Like he's going to take that as a suggestion and he's going to start running with it. The guys that have a hard time moving from one level to the next and really competing is they're going to take what you said and they're going to do that verbatim. And they're not going to have the variance in the adjustments. And unfortunately, as you move up, the time and space becomes less and less and less. And so a lot of what you have to do is either manipulate your environment or react quickly to problem solve your environment. The kids that can problem solve or even better dictate the terms, those kids I think have a higher probability of being able to move their skill along with them. The other kids might have to restrict, 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 it, not to say they're not going to make it. There's lots of ways to do it, but I'm talking skill guy. The skill guys are going to find a way based on their ability to have a multiplicity of skill inside of a given uh, skill set. Perfect. Got some more coming in here. Um, how do you, how do you suggest developing game transfer during the COVID period with no games? Well, geez. If you're going to ask a question to stump the coach, that's probably a good one. I, I, my best answer is I think that we could probably use COVID as a great way to use video more and be able to teach our players um, through game clips. Uh, a lot of times we, we don't have a lot of time. Listen, we all got day jobs. We got wife, we got kids, we got husbands, we got whatever. And uh, we get to the rink, we run the practice. We might do a little video session or whatever, but uh, we got a lot of time tied up just in planning practice, getting to the rink and all this other stuff. Now you get COVID, you got a team of kids and nowhere to go. So these are great opportunities now to pull up some clips. We just had the world juniors go on it's a wonderful tournament. You can grab those, that video from just about anywhere. You pull it up and you start getting your kids to talk through it and try to work on uh, just what they see and options and ideas. And I think talking through game clips is great. One of my big arguments with our kids today's kids is that they tend to consume the game in bite-sized pieces, like only highlights. They go on Instagram, they can watch 500 clips of all over the world of toe drags. And they can watch them on, and they come in in like little bits, little bits, little bits, which is great. The only problem is, is that 
there's context. Like there was something that happened in the defensive zone that allowed the guy to get the route, to be able to get the guy, to be able to manipulate the situation. And sometimes because we only consume the game in small little bite sizes, a lot of times the real gold is in what happened before. It's like the old adage, like um, if you were to evaluate a goal that went in, Usually you could trace it back to something that happened like five, seven, 10 seconds earlier, sometimes more earlier that this happened. And that's what really led to that chance. We don't do enough of that. And I think COVID presents a lot of opportunity for us to maybe take our kids down an exploratory uh, way of looking at video that's away from the small bits, the, the you know, it, and, and I'm not saying it's terrible to do that. I'm just saying if that's the only way you're consuming video, I think it's narrow. Perfect. Some more can come in here. How would you differentiate between technique and skill? Um, well, technique is like a, uh, technique is like a skeleton. Okay. It's got the bones and it has like a structure to it. And that structure provides opportunity to stack and build other things on top of it. Skill is the stacking of the things on top of the skeleton. So the technique is like the, the keeping the weight underneath the body. It's being on one foot or the other foot. It's the turning of the upper body to get the lower body going. It's the hand position. That's all your technique. Skill is the variability of what you can do within that, within that skeletal structure. And so you need both there. I don't, you know, it's like one lends itself to the other, the better bones and structure you have, the more different things you can do. The weaker that skeletal structure is the hard, the more limited or the more limitations are going to come inside your expression of skill. Skill usually is also not a singular element. It's a multitude or an interaction of two or three things that come together. That's usually skill. It's, it's like a blend of a couple of things and it, that's how it gets expressed. So uh, that's, 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 a, that's a great question, actually. I love that question. That's right up my alley. Uh, we got three more as of right now for you. Um, can you, how do you differ, differentiate between coaching and teaching? Well, uh, coaching, coaching is group. Teaching is individual or it's personal. I, I, I think that's the, the cleanest way I can describe it. Coaching is, uh, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to make out a lesson plan. I make out the lesson plan for what the group. It's got work rest ratios. It's got how the whole thing's going to go. How many kids are in this line? Who's passing to who? What's the rotation? That's a, how you're managing the whole group. You're going to show up at the rink for a game and you have a lineup card and you have what the lines are going to be. You have the game plan. You have all, it's all, whatever's group. I feel like that's more coaching. When you start saying little Tommy, we need you to find a way to be more creative. We need to get you, we taught you something on Tuesday. Now we need you to do it on Wednesday. That's teaching. You're creating a personal relationship with him. You're building trust. You're creating equity so that he feels comfortable to be able to perform or to try things or to, to, to be his best self. You're creating an environment in which he feels like he can, he can do something. That is teaching. Uh, and that's how, I, that's how I define it. Coaching is group. Teaching is individual. Personal. Perfect. Um, in minor hockey, where the talent gap can end up being so big, how do we continue to challenge the upper end talent-wise without over-challenging our bottom end? Well, I'm, I am someone who subscribes to a lead follow or get out of the way kind of attitude. Uh, I think that if you do uh, take your top end and you find ways for them to be challenged at times, like this is not a one size fits all, like just do this. But if you looked at your practice, you got, you know, well, you guys, you guys, uh, 
50 minutes, 60 minutes, an hour and a half, all the above. So you roll in and you're like, you know what? Um, at some point, we got to challenge our best players. And so we're going to do some skill work that is geared directly to, for them to be challenged. Now, we're not going to do that for 60 minutes. We're going to do that for a portion of the practice, maybe early on to get them thinking, to see if they can start weaving that stuff into other aspects of your practice when it's not all about them. And then there's another part of your practice, which is about the, the kids who are, you know, uh, the level of the league is here. And we, of course, have a level of our kids who are here. So we're trying to find ways to get them to push them forward. So that might be a, another aspect of, of your practice, which becomes focused on that group. Now, here's the crux of it. What are you doing when you have the best players being challenged? How can you help these other group focus on what's important for them? What should they focus on? Well, they should focus on the technique while the other group is focused on the multiplicity of the skill, this group is focused on the, 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 the uh, bones or the skeletal part of what it is that you're focused on. That's how you get around it. That way it allows you to do both. I think you can do both, but I don't think you should do both all the way through. I think there's times where you want your group, your, your top kids or your group to really focus on Technique, like you can never be too good of a skater on your inside edge or your outside edge, even though that's something that's incredibly challenging and very important for a kid who can't do it as part of your team, but you have a kid who can do it, you can challenge him in other ways by getting him to turn his head opposite the direction in which his edge work is going. You could have him lead with his stick. You could have him do all kinds of different things where you're stacking on top. Meanwhile, the other guy, you're just trying to hold an edge for as long as you can before he falls. No problem. Those are the ways that I think are, are important in, in your world. And trust me, your world is not much different than many others. You have a lead. And what I mean by that is you have a median level of performance that occurs in your league. You will always have a certain percentage of kids that are above that in a certain percentage of kids who are below that, regardless of the league you're in. So if you're on a Bantam team, a Bantam A team, and you got kids and you're like, oh my God, like these kids are way up here. They're closer to midget than they are to Bantam. Then I got these kids down here. They're closer to Adam than they are to Pee Wee. That's a big, that's a big swing, but that's not unlike other teams in the league. You're not, you're not, that's not a unique experience for you. So the way you challenge that is you have to challenge both. I think you got to do it at both different times. I think you have to be very specific about how you're challenging each group. Awesome. We got uh, four more and then we'll get you out of here. This, one is a, this one's a little bit of a, a novel here. Um, a lot of elements of teaching method requires a player to adopt an internal control. Uh, example, focusing on weight, weight shift, being on one foot, separating upper body from lower body, et cetera. Has there been players you have worked with who end up micromanaging their movement to a point in games that they're unable to perform or make the appropriate reads? If so, does your approach with the player change the next time you work with him or her? Uh, okay, let me, uh, this is, this got about six elements into it. I'm going to, I'm going to pull it down into just a couple. So the crux of the question, I would I would interpret as um, when the player is hyper-focused on a given aspect and they're trying to implement that in a game and, it, and, and they're presented with a level of failure, what do we do? And the answer that I have for that is, is that you continue along that path and you also find other aspects to go with it. So what we're talking about is one element of, of in the week, I might've taught them three or four elements and you have, you're hoping that one of those is something that they do really well. And some of them are things that they do poorly. Now, the trick to the whole thing is if you want to speed up this process and veer away from things where the player is going to be really uncomfortable and trying things in a game, 
you should attach everything to their best asset. So if they're a good skater and you're trying to teach them something, find a way to get the skating to become part of what you're doing so that they feel comfortable with that as their main asset. If they're a really bright kid, they see the game really well, but they struggle with some of the movement stuff, then have that, 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 uh, that high IQ leveraged inside of what it is that you're doing. If they've got really good hands, use the hands to work the upper body, to get the upper body going, to keep, get the lower body going uh, uh, more automatically. So there's just ways to leverage what you're trying to do from one, from one skill. You can, uh, you can attach a leverage something, a good asset into that other thing. I, I, hope, I hope I answered that. Um, yeah, no, that's perfect. Thanks. Um, three more to go here. How often would you watch a video from practice with the players, for example, to show the skill progression via the sequences, or is that more for your own self-evaluation post-practice? Uh, both. Um, I like to watch my uh, sessions back um, because there's lots of times that I really suck, to be honest with you. I'm not very good sometimes, and I need to know why, no different than the player. And there's things that I try that are not, they don't work and I, I need to evaluate that. So that's, that's an important aspect. Um, how often do I like to look at things with players and lists? So I wouldn't watch a practice back with a player. I would watch four or five clips of something that they did in the practice. And, and these are, this is a narrative that I'm trying to build to high, to focus them on something that I want them to improve in the future. No different than a game. I'm not a proponent to watch shifts with players. I don't think that that's as effective as what looking at lists. Hey, you're a winger. You suck at getting pucks out on the wall. Here's five examples of you failing on the wall. Here's two examples of you doing really well. We need to move you towards of getting really well. Here's some video of it. What can we do beforehand? Problem solved. But they're looking at five, six clips, seven clips. That's it. And they're back to back to back. And that's the ball game. I don't really like to do things where there's like a multitude. Like you, you watch a shift. Honestly, if you really watch a shift with the player, you could find 500 things that they do well, not good. Like, there's a, like all of a sudden you, you, you go, Oh, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And I, I always like to say to coaches, like at the end of it, ask the player to give you three things they remember. Half the time they're like, holy shit, like he gave me 500 things. I don't know. There, there's so many things I need to fix or address. If you just focus on the one thing and you have five clips for it, one, it's way easier for you, less time consuming. You can hit every player on your team this way. And it's easier for the player to consume. And you just have to prioritize what's important to give them. Perfect. Uh, two to go. This one's a little bit of a loaded question, seeing as we are a branch of Hockey Canada. Um, internationally, who does the best job in skill development? Oh, come on, man. Um, I think that there's, I think that, you know, this is, this is not the answer that you're looking for. Um, but this might be the best answer I got. So the, one of the, one, what we do really well in Canada and in the U S cause we are very similar in the way that we approach things has tremendous value. The way in which we, we talk about how they compete, uh, the way in which our players have structure, uh, the way in which our players are uh, relatively selfless in, in those are values in which we are, we are expounding and perpetuating throughout from coast to coast. As you can see, internationally, we do a great job. We produce some high-end players that have these elements. That's one thing. Now you go to some of the European uh, spaces and I'm going to talk about like your Finland and your Sweden and your teams like that. And they do a lot of great stuff as it relates to isolation. Like the kids have unbelievable hands. They can flip pucks over this. They can flip pucks over that. They can do some great, then they one-on-one -on -one skill is fantastic. Uh, you look at a team, like you look at a country like Russia who tries to play like much more of like this whole like, possession game and things like that. Like there's lots to, to gain from what they do. Um, the answer is, is that the smartest 
play is to find out what people are doing at the best in all of what they do in, in every country and try to use that as your starting point, not try to say, oh, that's the best one. So, oh, Sweden won the world championships, whatever. They're that, okay, that's the model. Everybody's got to do that. I, I don't believe that that's necessarily the best way to do it. I, I think that we need to take the, in the, the pieces that are really identifiable or like uh, identity oriented of each of those countries, respect what they do best, find out what they do and try to figure out a way to come at it from a much more holistic uh, perspective. That I think is our best, is, is the best uh, bang for our buck. I'm not one that's like, oh, remember there was like a whole thing where uh, years ago, like all the best goalies were coming out of Quebec. So it's like, everybody's like, whatever they're doing in Quebec, we're doing that. And then of course that all fades out. Then it's like, whoa, all the best player, all the best goalies are coming out of, out of Europe, whatever they're doing over there, that's what we're doing. I'm more like, let's find out what they're doing and then let's try to build upon that in anticipation that people are going to figure this out and that's going to become irrelevant. So it's not that, you know, oh, Canada, we're no good or, oh, Canada, we're the best answer. Um, it's more like each country has some interesting pieces. We should find out what each one of those are and try to amalgamate that into all of what we do, but not just verbatim. I don't like just stealing what someone does. I like to take that, see what works, and then build upon it. That's what I think we got to be better at. Awesome. Uh, just two quick ones here, and we'll get you out. This is uh, chapter two of the novel. Uh, when reviewing your teaching performance on the practice sessions video, do you have a specific evaluation process you follow? Example, qualitative and or quantitative questions. Um. Yeah, like I, one of the things that I, I like to do for myself personally is I, there's kind of two ways I like to evaluate the practice. One is in my interaction with the players, they are telling me, they're giving me information as to what, whether I'm doing well or not, they're, whether they're understanding, whether I'm challenging them enough. And what I mean, sometimes the purpose of the practice is to, like humble a bit. And so I want it to be a little clunky and I don't want it to run smoothly. And I want it to be an awakening of that. There's a need. So sometimes like, I don't, I think a perfect practice for me is not something where everyone makes every pass and every shot goes in the net and everybody looks crisp like that to me, like that to me tells me I didn't challenge them enough. So that's not a, a good grade. The other, the other way in which I evaluate myself is I, personally, because of where I, I'm always looking at vantage points. So if I was watching a particular drill, did I look at it from different angles? So did I move? So a lot of times I get lazy because I'm a little bit chunky now, more chunkier than I used to be. I like my M&Ms. I get a little heavy. I'm on the ice for a lot of time. I get lazy. What I mean by that is the drill's going on. I got a player working. I should be looking at this from at least four different spots. If I don't move to four different spots, then I'm lazy. That's how I view it. If I'm trying to stand and watch these players perform from the one single spot and expect to collect all the information that I need to make good decisions, I'm nuts. It's not possible. I need to collect information. That's my job. I need to evaluate what's going on make quick decisions as to what to do next. And I'm not going to have the most amount of information unless I'm moving. If I'm not moving, then I'm lazy and I get lazy. I got to be honest with you. I don't, I get in spots where I'm standing in one spot and I'm only seeing it from that perspective. That's wrong. So when I watch myself a lot, the one of the first things I look for is vantage points. And then I'm also looking for um, speed of correction. So I know when I made a correction, I stopped, I made a correction. I want to know how quickly the player adopted my correction. If I didn't, if he doesn't show improvement, that means I picked the wrong one. I'm, I'm, I misjudged which way I should have gone. I corrected his upper body when I should have corrected his lower body. I corrected his hands before I corrected this. I didn't move the puck or didn't do whatever it was. I made the wrong choice. And so I need to look at that. And, and that's an important part of my process. 
Awesome. We'll get you out of here on one last question coming from Brian. Brian, Mike's yours. Daryl, um, I've listened to you speak on a lot of podcasts, especially since your book release. I follow you're the you one. Me. You're the I'm one the, guy. Oh, I'm thank the, God. I, I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm the only one. No. Um, but you have you have a very interesting background and story for a guy at now at your level in the business, working with the the people you work with and where you've brought yourself. Could you just share with the coaches on the call tonight, sort of where you came from and and kind of how you got here? I know it's a lifelong story, but there's a there's there's some aspects to it that are really interesting. So um, when I was a kid, I desperately wanted to play hockey, but my parents couldn't afford for me to play. So I didn't start playing hockey until I was 12. My dad came from the idea. He, he used to work uh, Monday through Friday. And then on Saturdays, they, my, both him and my mom worked until 12 o'clock. In my hometown, the, at, 12, at 12 o'clock, that was second year peewee. That was when the, the peewees were playing. So my dad was like, I have to work. I'm not sending you with the neighbor every Saturday. It's not happening. I, if I can't take you myself, I, you're not going. And we didn't have the money to do it anyway. So it, none of that really mattered. So I didn't start playing until I was 12. When I started playing, I, I was on a guy on the street. I was doing the road hockey. I was trying to do everything I could. Cause I was, I'm like, when I get a chance to play, I'm going to be elite, elite. I get out there and it's like I'm at a train station and guys are flying by like I'm standing. I couldn't skate. I couldn't move this and that. So I'm like, okay, this is not going to work. I'm not going anywhere like this. Like I can't learn to skate this fast. These guys have been playing since they're four. Here I am. I'm at 12. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the goalie. The goalie doesn't do anything. Look at him. He stands there. He doesn't move. He doesn't know. He must not be able to know how to skate not realizing that goalie has to be the best skater. So I decide I'm going to play goal. I played two years of house league. I played two years of rep. And the next thing you know, I'm playing junior C hockey in my, like near my hometown. So I went from in five years, I went from couldn't do nothing to I'm 17 years old. And now I'm playing, I say play loosely, but I was, uh, I was on this, I made this team. So inside of that year, it became crystal clear. I don't belong there. And so that was it. All of a sudden I went like this and then done. So here I am, I'm 17 years old. And I'm like, uh, like I, I feel so much passion towards the game. What am I going to do now? Like it's over. Like I, there's nowhere for me to play. Like I, I can't do anything. So I'm like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to coach. So I did all the Hockey Canada things. I went from zero to like level four. Now level four at that time, was uh, you went, I went to Ottawa for a week. It was a week long thing. And you went there for a week. So here's me, I'm like 18 years old and I'm there at the Hockey Canada thing. I meet this guy, Mickey Goulet. Those of you in the greater Ottawa area would know Mickey Goulet. He's uh, infamous or famous, depending on your perspective, coach of University of Ottawa. And he told me when I was there, uh, one of the guys introduced me, he said, hey, I'm looking for a video coach. I'm like, I'm your guy. He's like, you ever done video before? I, said, I have no idea. He's like, you're in. You can come, but uh, we can give you $100 a week and you're going to be working the bingos. That's your deal. I said, I'm in. So I went to move to Ottawa. I was whatever, 18, 19 years old. And uh, I stayed the year and uh, I was the video guy. So I'm dubbing from one VCR to the other. This is what I'm doing, okay? And I'm there every day in the coach's room and I'm listening. So at one point, um, Mickey says, hey, you see this player out here? I say, yeah. He says, he should be in the NHL. So well, what's he doing here? He says, well, he has three or four skills that he could have used, learned when he was 12 or 11 or 10, like when he was really young, and he missed them. So now he's up here. I don't have time to change it. It's not going to change. He ain't playing. So that's why he's here. So he says, we need people – we need people on the grassroots making sure that this kid learns those three or four skills. So he does not sit in here with me. He's playing the NHL. He's like, do you know how many kids are like that? I'm like, no, he says, there's a lot. So I said, I'm going home. So at the end of the season, March, I went home and I opened my business. I'm like, I can't skate. I was a goalie. 
I couldn't do nothing. I didn't know nothing. I could dub from one VCR to the next that I was good at. I go home and I'm like, I start private lessons. And every, I had to, one of my buddies was like, Daryl, you're going to have to get rid of the goalie skates. It's a monkey see monkey do business. So garbage in garbage out. So if you can't do it, it ain't going to get done. And if you want to be good, you got to learn how to do it. So I dubbed hockey Canada, tape it every Saturday. And then I start dubbing clips and you know, the old TV with the VCR at the bottom of the TV, I got that in tow. I take it to the rink, I plug it in and it's right there at the boards. I'm there at 6 AM and I'm on the ice and I'm teaching myself to skate, to handle the puck, to shoot. So I go through that whole process and I end up starting to coach and I teach. And then eventually uh, this guy comes to me and he says, Hey, Daryl, and this changed my life. This changed my life. Daryl, you're a really passionate guy. He says, you're crazy. You know, you're nuts. Uh, you, you talk about stuff that I don't know anything about. Um, what I have is I, I want to make a spring team, but uh, I want the best players. Like I don't want my, I want my kid to be the ninth player, ninth best forward on the team. So eight, all eight kids have to be better. I'm going to pay you to go find any kid that's better than my kid, put them on this team. I'm like, what's the hook? They're not going to come for me. Like, I look like I'm 12. I can't skate. I can hardly do anything. Like, why are they coming? These are the best kids in the region. Why are they coming? Tell them it's free. They'll come. So I go out. I get all the players. And in that group was Nathan Horton, Daniel Girardi, Andre DeVoe, uh, Daniel Paye. We're talking five, six NHL players, future NHL players. I got them. They're 10, 11 years old. That started my business. We started with those guys. We started moving those guys through. They, I opened my hockey school. They all kept coming to the hockey school. Nathan Horton was unbelievable. So everyone started coming because of him. And then I just started, all my goal was make Nathan Horton better. That's it. Everyone else, it doesn't matter. Just make him better. Everyone else will just be by osmosis. So as it turns out, in that group of kids, there were four years of teams that we ended up building. You had a one in eight chance of playing a national hockey league. If you were with us in that period of time, out of that group was Patrick Kane came out of there. I started with him when he was nine years old and I built it from there. Once the kids got to the NHL, like Horton got there at 18. Um, Kane got there, of course, when he was uh, 19. Um, Paye, I think was 19 or 20. Once they started getting the NHL, when, when they left to go left our area and they started playing the OHL and college or whatever it was that they were going, um, I was like, what will they come back for the summer? Like, what am I doing? I don't know what to do. Uh, so I asked them, what do you want to work on? And they're like, well, the coach says I need to be faster. I'm like, Oh geez. Like that doesn't tell me much. So then I started to tell them, Hey, tell your billet to tape some games and send me the discs. So at that time we were up to, we were past the BCRs. We're back. We're now on DVD discs. So I start getting these discs and I start studying. How many times does he get the puck? Where does he get the puck? How many plays does he make? Does he make plays on his backhand? What's the skating? What about everybody else? And I'm studying. So now when they come back, I already know what they need to work on. So that's how it started. And then that built my analytic business, which, which is now the lifeblood of my company. And uh, I was the uh, one final part of the, of the building of Daryl. I, uh, I got a job as the coach mentor at, in Brantford minor hockey. I think I was about 24, 25 years old. And uh, there I met a guy named Larry Stevens, Larry Stevens brother is John Stevens, who uh, is a coach in the national hockey. League. But at the time he was a head coach of the Philadelphia phantoms. So he says, uh, his brother introduces me to him and uh, he tells me, he's like, hey, I got all these questions. I'm like, I'll answer any question you want. You tell me what you need, send me the disc, I'll chase it down. So that's what I did. He sent me the disc. He's like, hey, here's a question about my team. Go answer it. So I get the disc, I put my spreadsheets together. I tell him this is how much times this is happening. This is how many times this is happening. And I send it back to him. No money, gives me no money, like nothing. So I'm like, and I don't care. And it takes me hours and hours and days and days and days. And then I just ship it back to him. Here's my report. So unbeknownst to me, John was taking this information and he was sharing it 
in their meetings. And the assistant general manager at the time was a guy named Dean Lombardi. And Dean Lombardi ended up getting a job with the Los Angeles Kings, as we know. Well, five years into that, or three or four years into that, I get a phone call. I'm just driving down the road like anybody. All of a sudden, the phone rings. Hey, uh, hello. Yeah, it's uh, Dean Lombardi. I'm like, hold on. Pull over. I'm like dying. Yes, Mr. Lombardi, what can I do? He's like, I want to meet you. I said, okay, great. When can I meet you? How about tomorrow? I'm in Toronto. I go and meet him. And uh, I bring my suitcase full of all the studies I got. I never open it once. He talks to me about my business and what I'm like as a person, how I grew up and all this other stuff. He ends up hiring me. And uh, I spent four years with the LA Kings. And my job was to answer questions for Dean Lombardi. He had a question. I would go and research it, come back, give him the answer of whatever I figured out. And then he would give me a thousand more questions. I'd go back, do that research. That's how it started. All at the same time as I was doing that, I had my other players and my business was going and I started to get more and more and more players. And that's ultimately how, how it happened. But it, it was a, a, a lesson in you could not start from a worst position, no hockey ability, no background in hockey, no teaching ability, no uh, parent. My parents never played. My dad never played. No, like nothing. And you just start and you just keep going and you start asking questions and you start chasing things down. You do a lot of stuff for free. And eventually if you have passion and you have half a brain where you really start to try to put things together, you end up doing it like all of a sudden, next thing you know, I'm here talking to you guys and you guys think I'm good. But like 10 years ago, you guys would think, who the hell is this guy? So it, it's like, it could happen to anybody. Like it's really a, one of those stories. Like I'm, yes, I, I've achieved a lot and I've worked with the best players in the game and I learn more from them, trust me, than they'll ever learn from me. Um, but I'm smart enough, I guess, to realize that that is the case. And so I learn and I listen and I pay attention and then I'm able to transfer that into uh, the other things and ask other questions. And then I end up chasing down some pretty cool ideas and um, here I am. But um, I, I, I have no background. I don't, I don't have a bachelor's degree in anything other than hard knocks. And I just managed to manage to build this um, somehow, some way. And, and now I, I'm privileged to be able to share not only that story, but you know, whether it's the book or otherwise, like just a way of being like what happened in my process and how I got to be able to understand the game the way that I do. It's a little bit unique. Awesome. <laughs> it's a great way to end it. <laughs> that was a great presentation. We really appreciate um, you taking the time for us tonight. Uh, and I know our coaches are, are leaving with uh, some, some good information. So thanks a lot for that. I appreciate it. I would say that every coach that you have on the call is more qualified to work with the best players that I, the players that I work with than I did at that time. So if anybody wants to do it, it's right out there because to, to overcome me, I didn't have any advantages. You have every advantage way above. So if you're passionate about it, go get it. Thanks a lot. Good way to end it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks guys. Really appreciate the time. I loved it. Loved it. <laughs> appreciate it. Have a good night guys. Thanks awesome. a lot, Daryl. Thank you, Daryl. Thanks Daryl. Uh,